For three days, the long, weary hours had dragged by. Flight 316, with its 68 passengers, still sat on the runway at Kennedy International Airport. Why? Was it mechanical trouble? The weather? A hijacking? No. United States authorities only wanted to be sure that one particular passenger aboard that plane was not leaving the country against her will. But now in the presence of officials of both nations, she had said, I love my husband, but he made his decision to stay here, and I have made mine to leave. Had she spoken freely without coercion? The husband's lawyer responded, I couldn't say for sure. I wasn't able to tell. After all, she's an actress. Actress or not, her decision had been made, and so it was that after 72 hours, television lights went out. Reporters hurried to the telephones. Watching tourists turned to less exciting drama, and Flight 316 lifted into the evening sky. It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today It Is Written presents Winds on a Leash. Today I would like to respond to a request that has come in again and again and again. Let me put together for you all, or nearly all, of the various time prophecies in the Bible. It'll be fascinating, I promise you. You see, the story we've just told, that's the way God is, holding back the flight of time, turning aside disaster, blunting the power of the hurricane and the flood, restraining the winds of violence and terror and war, holding the hourglass on a slant so that the last grains of sand will not escape, forbidding history to sign out just yet, unwilling to wrap it all up until every man has decided whether he wants to or whether he does not want to be free. So often we've seen it happen. We prepared for the big disaster, even for doomsday, and somehow doomsday just didn't arrive. Before this half hour's over, you'll understand why. Hurricane Allen was billed as the big one, the storm of the century, we were told. A whole county was evacuated, yet its devastation was far less than expected. Again and again, a hurricane has been aimed directly at our nation's capital. Yet nearly always the storm has veered from its expected course, leaving Washington with only its fringe of steady rain. Why? Who restrains the fury of the storm? Who holds the winds on a leash? Have you ever wondered what would have happened if the Arabs had won the Yom Kippur War? What if the Israelis had turned to nuclear weapons, as it is rumored that they were about to do? What if the Shah of Iran had been deposed 25 years earlier? Would the whole course of history have been changed? Or what if that ill-fated rescue attempt on the 52 hostages had succeeded? What if there had been no dust storms that night on the Iranian desert? What if three helicopters had not failed? What if the flames of a burning jet had not lighted up the Iranian sky? Would the hostages have been killed? Would the well-intentioned mission, if successful, have triggered World War III? I don't know. But I do know that God is still in control. History, more often than we realize, is altered by divine intervention. God has often stopped the guns of men from shooting. He's used the fog to prevent men from, from their enemies, protect them from their enemies. He works in a thousand ways that have never crossed our minds. If it were not for his restraining hands upon the winds of international terror, Armageddon would have overtaken us long ere this. But it is God who 
says to the winds of war, as he says to the waves of the sea, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no farther. Yet one day soon the winds will be unleashed. They'll blow with a fury that defies imagination. It will not be a, it will not be a county that needs to be evacuated. It'll be an entire planet. In the meantime, what is happening? Revelation 7, verse 1, tells us, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. So that's it. Angels have been commissioned to hold the winds. And why? Verses 2 and 3 of the same scripture. Then I saw another angel come up, coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels, Do not harm the land, or the sea, or the trees, until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Angels are to hold the winds, not let them blow, until God's people are sealed in their foreheads with a visible mark. Oh, no. But many thousands of men and women and children will be so in love with Jesus that they'll say, Lord, I want to be marked as one of your children forever. But other thousands, the majority, unfortunately, will say in their hearts or by their actions, no, thank you, Lord. I know you died to save me, but I don't want to be saved. I choose to go my own way. And when every one of us has had a chance to decide, the winds will blow, will be ushered into a time of trouble such as this world has never known. The last grains of sand will escape the hourglass, and Jesus will return. Decision Magazine, in its June 1980 issue, carried a beautiful and very intriguing double spread. It was a poster, really, to be taken out and put on the wall. A magnificent cloud against a deep blue sky. Above the cloud on the left were the words of Jesus, Surely I come soon. And on the right, against the sky, were just two words. Perhaps today? Perhaps today. Certainly we ought, to, we ought to live as if our Lord might appear at any moment, but is it really possible to, that there, he, he might return this very day, even before this telecast is over? Or are there still some Bible predictions that must be fulfilled before he appears in the skies? I wonder if you realize how often Bible prediction has included a specific period of time. Evidently, many of you have because you've been asking for these to be put together. And I wonder if you realize how precisely these time prophecies have been fulfilled. Let's take a look. Residents of this planet in Noah's day were to have had 120 years of probation before the flood. It was exactly that. The deluge was to begin seven days after Noah entered the boat that he had built. It did. The rain would continue 40 days and 40 nights. It did. God revealed to Abraham at the time of his call that for 400 years his descendants would experience oppression in a strange land. They did. In Palestine and in Egypt. For 430 years after the promise to Abraham and 400 years after the oppression had begun, God brought them out of Egypt, I quote now from the Word of God, on the self same day. That's what the record says. God used Joseph in Egypt, you remember, to predict accurately what would happen to the butler and the baker in just three days. God had used Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dream, which pointed forward to seven years of famine. When the Israelites in the border, right there at the border of the Promised Land, lacked faith to enter it, they were told that they must wander in the wilderness for 40 days, each day representing a literal year. And they did. The prophet Elijah told Ahab that there would be neither dew nor rain in the next few years. The famine lasted three years and a half. Do you see how precisely all these prophecies were fulfilled? 
When God's people repeatedly rebelled, they were permitted to be taken captive to Babylon. That captivity was to last 70 years. When the time was up, God brought them back to their own land. The prophet Daniel accurately predicted that the proud king of Babylon would be banished from his throne. And that humiliating experience was to continue seven times or seven literal years. And now it becomes even more interesting. In a remarkable prophecy of Daniel, beginning in the year 457 B.C., 457 B.C., it was revealed that a probation of 70 weeks or 490 literal years, 490 literal years would be granted to the Jewish nation. Now, you recall that in a symbolic prophecy, a day represents a literal year. So 70 weeks would be 490 years. And at the end of 490 years, beginning in 457, in A.D. 34, A.D. 34, precisely fulfilling the prophecy, the gospel began to be preached to the Gentiles. Now, the same prophecy of Daniel, even more remarkably, pinpointed the year that Jesus began his ministry at his baptism in 27 A.D., that's when he was known as the Messiah. He began his ministry then. The very year that he would be crucified was also pinpointed 31 A.D. 31 A.D. Now, you understand, of course, that we're getting here only a quick overview of a prophecy that we've studied before. We've studied these details on other telecasts. But now, I'd like to ask you a question. Now that we've seen how amazingly and how precisely these time prophecies have been fulfilled, wouldn't you expect to find something in the Scriptures about when the world will end? Would God leave us in the dark about the most important event of all? Now, it's true that we're not told the exact moment or the day of our Lord's return because Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, as translated in the New International Version, he said, no one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. No, we cannot know the day or the hour. But Jesus himself, as well as the Bible prophets, gave us many signs that would signal the nearness of his coming. coming. They're being fulfilled before our eyes. Now, some of those don't touch time prophecies. We're talking about time prophecies today. But you see, you ask the question, is there no time prophecy that reaches down to these last days to let us know that they're indeed the last days? Yes, there is. It is a prophecy so important, a time period so significant, that we find it mentioned seven times in the Bible twice in the book of Daniel, the prophetic book of the Old Testament, and five times in the companion prophetic book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. The time period is given three different ways, in prophetic days, in prophetic months, and in prophetic years. Twice it's given as 1260 days, twice as 42 months, and three times as three years and a half. All of these refer to the, exactly the same period of time, 12 160 years. So let me put up 1260 years here to begin examining this prophecy. For you remember, again, I say that symbolic prophecy, a day represents a literal year. Now, this 1260 year period, beginning in AD 538, AD 538, and extending to 1798, 1798 extending corresponds roughly to the years of medieval persecution. And its close, the year 1798, marks the beginning of what Daniel calls the time of the end. Now, Jesus spoke of this period of persecution. He said in Matthew 24, 21, for there shall be there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Yes, merciful God that he is, he would not allow the distress, the persecution, 
to continue to the end of time, it would be cut short. Jesus himself said, verse 22, there in that second coming chapter of Matthew 24, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. But now notice what would happen. We're still reading from the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24. This time, verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now the persecution ceased along about 1776. 1776, the year of the American Declaration of Independence. And four years later, on May 19, 1780, the prophecy was fulfilled. Still within the time period, you see, but after the persecution came New England's famous dark day. The strange darkness of the day was followed by equally strange darkness of the night, just as Jesus had said. And thousands got the message that he would soon return. In fact, many thought that was the end of the world right there on the dark morning of May 19. It was not many years later on November 13 of 1833 that the prediction of Jesus was filled, fulfilled right here, 1833, with a great meteoric shower, the greatest probably ever witnessed. Do you see what we've been doing? We're tracing the time prophecies down as far as we can toward the end. We know that the time of the end begins here, and the time of the end will stretch just as long as God intends it to. But that the year 1798 marked the beginning of the time of the end. The last of these signs in the heavens took place in the year 1833. And now we can go only 11 years farther, and that's all. 11 years farther. For the same prophecy of Daniel that pinpointed the year of the crucifixion, a prophecy that extends over 2,300 years, look, 2,300 years, beginning in 457, the longest time prophecy in the Bible, that prophecy terminates in the year 1844. 1844. We've studied it in detail on other telecasts, and we discovered that in the year 1844, Jesus began an investigation of the records of men in preparation for his coming and the separation of the saved from the lost, which must take place at that time. The year 1844, that's all there is. There's no specific time prophecy in the Bible that takes us any farther. By the way, Would you like to have a script of today's telecast and this chart so you can study these out together and then we can give you other materials to fill in with more detail if you wish? Do you see what this means? It means that so far as any time prophecy is concerned, Jesus could not have returned to earth any time, Jesus, I should say, could return to earth any time after 1844. He's not waiting for any prophetic time period to end. Prophecy is not holding him back. Then why hasn't he returned? For nearly 200 years, we've been living in the time of the end. And why isn't he here? Two scriptures. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do you see the reason, or at least one of them, for the delay? Our wonderful Lord, our compassionate, loving Savior, doesn't want anybody to be lost. And so he holds up the final flight of time. He slows the march of history because some have not yet made a decision. He doesn't want one of us to be lost. And now again the scripture that we read earlier from Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the winds, the four winds of the earth. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, 
having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And now you know why the winds of trouble and terror and all-out war have not yet been unleashed. Now you know why a lighted match in the Middle East has not blown us into World War III? Now you know why hurricanes so often have been turned aside? Now you know why doomsday hasn't happened to an unsuspecting planet yet. But it will not always be that way. Today, as I speak these words, the angels have not let go, though it seems that they might be loosen, loosening their grip. Today, as I speak these words, it's not too late to make our choice for eternity. Today, as I speak these words, I can tell you, on the authority of Scripture, that Jesus will not return today. There's still some prophecies to be fulfilled. But tomorrow, friend, tomorrow, the words that I speak today may be out of date. The words that, you are, true, that are true today may not be true tomorrow. For tomorrow, the roar of unleashed winds may deafen us with their fury. And once they're unleashed, once time begins its final approach for a rendezvous with eternity, the prophecies of Revelation, those that are left, will be fulfilled with a rapidity that will take your breath away. Friend, are you ready for the winds to blow? Is there a mark on your forehead that no human eye can see, a mark that says, You've chosen the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to be His forever. If you haven't made that choice, you can make it now. Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you've done, however black your sins, you can make that choice now and be forgiven. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for the revelation. Little did many of us dream that God had been so specific with his dealings with the human race? Now we see the last hours are upon us. The angels holding the winds at this moment are soon to be released in their fearful responsibility. Lord, prepare us for that day and wash us in your precious blood and take our sins away. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Hello, I'm Roland Lenhoff. Surely the message you've just heard has given you a lot to think about. And no doubt you'd like a copy of the script sent to you. And also a copy of this helpful time chart. Well, that's exactly what we're offering you today. So when you call or write, simply ask for the script and the chart for this program entitled Winds on a Leash. And we'll get it right on its way to you. And now here's the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, that's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Thank you for your letters and prayer requests. Be sure to mention the offer by name when you write George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. This is our It Is Written studio. But at the moment, it's empty. Normally at this time of the year, our familiar set stands here just as you saw it a moment ago on our program today. Olive trees blossom and wave in the breezes of the air conditioning system. And silhouetted against these familiar blue skies stands our set. Appropriate furniture is about the room, and the studio is alive with the sounds of new and challenging programs.
programs planned to meet the deepest needs of men and women everywhere. But with the rising costs of production, spiraling costs of television time, we've had to cut the production of 16 new programs. That's one half of a year's supply of new releases to attempt to balance our budget. We had no other responsible choice. So you see, rising costs not only threaten station time, but production of new programs as well. Now, we do repeat 20 programs a year, mostly in the summer months, as you know, as a budget-saving measure. But 36? That can't happen very often, or we'd be off the air permanently. For this and other similar reasons, I'm forced to appeal to our friends, you viewers, to help us. We need, actually need, 100,000 new donors who can send 15, 25, 50, or $100 in tax-deductible gifts to It Is Written, preferably monthly, of course, but at least now, once. If the Holy Spirit has benefited you or your family through this ministry, would you kindly join those who are giving to bring you this program? I say staggering costs make appeals such as this an absolute necessity. And the task of shouldering this financial responsibility is not so heavy if there are many, many people involved in carrying the load. I'm hoping that you'll be one of our viewers who today helps keep It Is Written on the air. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for that kind of practical response. As for the offer today, we're happy to send it to you, but kindly enclose a gift if you are able. Send it to It Is Written, Box 0, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. ever wondered if Jesus really rose from the dead? We read in the Bible of Jesus' glorious resurrection, but could it have been a hoax? Join us as we probe into every aspect of the resurrection story when we present Hoax or History next week at this same time.